Hi everybody, I'm Jonty. I'm an astronomer here at USQ, having been here just a few months now settling in in this lovely city, Toowoomba. What I'll be telling you about in this small section are the events that we think took place at the very end of the main stage of planet building in our solar system. The very exciting story of giant collisions. Now giant collisions are something which are a very recent event in terms of theory. They're not something we'd considered when talking about planet formation until the last 20 years or so. If you go back 100 years or 200 years, we were starting to come up with stories of how planets formed. And like many things, the idea originally was that it was a very gentle and quiescent process. Story runs almost parallel to ideas in geology. If you go back 100 years, the idea of plate tectonics was being developed. But very few geologists were willing to accept that the Earth could change. They thought the Earth was a serene and quiet place. It's very much the same when you talk about the formation of planets. It took a very long time for scientists to realise that the final parts of planet formation were violent, chaotic and abrupt. Where I'll start with this story is this unusual object here. Look at this object. What does it look like? Think it's the moon. Afraid it's not. This is the smallest planet in our solar system, the planet Mercury. Almost everybody, the first time they see a close-up picture of Mercury, thinks it's the moon. It's very similar. It's an arid, airless, rocky world, pockmarked by impacts. But there are subtle differences. You don't see any of the mare, the seas, that you see on the face of the moon that faces the Earth. You instead just see this pockmarked, barren world. Now, Mercury has always been thought of as something of an oddity. So if you compare Mercury to the terrestrial planets, the rocky planets in our solar system, we see something very unusual. If you try to work out how the planets formed, where they formed, try and work out how big they should be, you can see that Mercury is much smaller than Venus, the Earth and Mars. Much smaller planet. If we look at what it's composed of, though, it's much denser, much heavier than we would expect it to be for that size. It's an unusual object. In fact, if you take the measurements of Mercury's mass and its size, it's the densest of the planets by quite a long distance. We now understand that the reason Mercury is so dense is because it's almost entirely composed of iron and nickel. If you take a step back and think about the Earth for a moment, what do we know about the Earth? The Earth's very structured. If you look at the interior, we have a crust that floats on top of a mantle, and in the middle we have a core. And the great majority of the Earth's iron and nickel are locked up in that core. So what does Mercury look like? If we look at Mercury, it looks like the core of a planet, but without a mantle and a crust on top it looks like a shattered planet. And that's the current best theory for what Mercury is. So in the animation I'm about to show you, you're going to see at the very start two planets touching, kissing one another. One of them is Proto-Mercury, the planet we think had formed where Mercury is now situated. And that planet initially would have been twice the size of the planet we observe today, twice as large. That planet would have separated out just like the Earth has into a crust, a mantle and an iron nickel core. And then at the very end of planet formation, another planet, an object the size of Mercury that we know today, crashed into it and shattered it. So here you see the two planets collide, a material immediately splashed outwards. The blue dots you're seeing here are the mantle and the crust, they're the silicate material. The red dots you'll see in a minute are the core. What we've done here is taken away everything that was ejected never to, retur never to return, and we're only showing you the things that will come back to form the planet at the end. All of the red is still bound, will collapse back inwards. But the blue has almost entirely been stripped. We've removed the mantle, we've removed the crust, and we've left behind this barren core, no atmosphere. Everything volatile that could make an atmosphere stripped away. Everything light that could make a crust and a mantle stripped away. So with Mercury, you have the victim of an interplanetary collision, a celestial hit and run. All you have left is a core, frozen in space with a little bit of rubble on top. And this is our best story, our best explanation for why the unusual planet Mercury looks the way it does. Now, sounds a long shot, two planets colliding, but everywhere we look in our solar system, the more we study our solar system, the more we find evidence that planets have collided, not occasionally, but frequently at the very final stages of planet formation. Here is Mars, our closest, most Earth-like neighbour at least at the current day. Smaller than the Earth, significantly smaller, it's about a third the size of our planet. 
but it has an atmosphere, it has ice caps, we see clouds in the atmosphere sometimes. We think even very occasionally you get liquid water on the surface of Mars. It's probably the most Earth-like planet in terms of climate at the current epoch. One thing that's really puzzled people for a long time about Mars, however, is when you look at Mars and you plot the altitude of the terrain across the planet, you get something they call the hemispherical dichotomy, which is basically a long-winded and overly scientific way of saying that one hemisphere is higher than the other. Think of maps of the Earth, terrain maps. You get highland coloured in one colour, lowland coloured in another, and it gives you a way to visualise mountains and seas. So on the left here, we have a fabulous photograph of Mars. Beautiful in the middle is the largest canyon in the solar system, Valles Marineris. That canyon, from edge to edge, stretches so far that if you place it across Australia, it would run from Perth to Brisbane. It's so big that if you stood in the middle, you wouldn't be able to see the walls there be across the horizon. Spectacular feature, but if we instead look at the two images on the right, we're looking at the two faces of Mars, two hemispheres of Mars, where the colour tells us the height. The white and the red are highlands, 10 kilometres above the average higher than Everest is above sea level. The blues are the lowlands going down to 10 kilometres below the average height, deeper than the deepest trench on Earth, the Mariana Trench. Mars has this huge vertical range on its surface, but what's interesting is that one hemisphere is predominantly highland, the other is predominantly lowland. And this has puzzled people for a very long time. Our understanding was delayed a little bit by these spots, the four volcanoes, the biggest volcanoes in the solar system, including Olympus Mons, an enormous, huge shield volcano like the volcanoes in Hawaii that distort the shape a little bit. But a few years ago, scientists looked at this map and realised that if you take those volcanoes away, you really do have one high hemisphere and one low hemisphere. And the current best story to explain this is that Mars was smashed by something maybe the size of our, room, our moon right at the end of planet formation, and this excavated a crater the size of the planet. So the lowlands are the floor of the crater, the highlands are what Mars was like before the impact. Two planets, two giant collisions. Here are two more of the solar system's planets. On the left you see Venus, Earth's other nearest neighbour, interior to the Earth. If you'd been around when the planets formed, four billion years ago, Venus probably looked very much like the Earth. It probably had oceans, an atmosphere. We're not absolutely certain, but that's very, very likely. However, today we see a horrific hell-like world. The temperature at the surface is hot enough to melt lead. The pressure at the surface is hot enough, to, is high enough to crush you. Rain sulfuric acid, not a nice place to visit at all. But in many other ways it's very similar to the Earth, only very slightly smaller. The really peculiar thing about Venus, however, is that it spins on its axis not once every day like the Earth does, but once every 243 days. That's fairly remarkable, it's barely spinning at all. But it's even more remarkable when you think that the time it takes Venus to go around the Sun, the year on Venus, is only 224 days. So it takes Venus longer to spin on its axis than it does for it to complete a lap of the Sun. In other words, the year is shorter than the day. That's a bit crazy. Many things have been proposed to try and explain this, many different stories, many different theories. But the best theory I've heard is that Venus had a lot of its spin stripped away by a giant impact. Much the same way you can imagine if you're playing football. Ball's flying across to you, spinning dramatically, you want to trap it. You can kick the ball in such a way that you stop the spin and leave it just sitting there, no spin. That's one of the ways we can explain the lack of spin for Venus. It's a bit speculative still, maybe that new theories come out in coming years, but at the moment this is the best contender. On the right we see the planet Uranus, far out in the depths of the solar system, 19 times further from the Sun than the Earth is. In fact, the first planet to be discovered rather than to have been known since prehistory. Uranus is very odd. All of the planets aside from Uranus spin pretty much on end. In other words, their tilt to the plane of the, their orbits is only 10 or 20 degrees. This is the reason we have the seasons on the Earth. The axis around which we spin is tilted slightly to our orbit around the Sun. So sometimes Australia is tilted towards the Sun a bit more and we get summer. Other times it's tilted away from the sun a bit more and we get winter. On Uranus, the pole of the planet points directly towards the sun at certain times in the year. In other words, the planet's tipped over by 90 degrees. Spins around, that means everywhere on Uranus is like being in the Arctic or the Antarctic. You get six Uranian months 
of winter, six Uranian months of summer, no matter where you are on the planet, other than a very tiny band near the equator, it's been knocked over. Now Uranus's year is 84 years long, so six Uranian months of sunshine of summer is actually 42 years. In other words, you can be an adult, be middle-aged, before the end of summer. Now that's kind of cool. Again though, this is hard to explain. The fact that all the planets spin in about the same direction, apart from Uranus, is telling us something about how they formed. And it takes us back again to the ballet dancer bringing her arms in, the conservation of angular momentum. It's a real shock then to find a planet that spins tipped over. And the only way we can explain this, once again, is that at the end of Uranus's formation, at some point after it formed, a planet the size of the Earth hit Uranus, tipped it over. Because Uranus tipped over, all of Uranus's moons collided with each other, destroyed each other. The material from them reformed around the planet's new equator and formed into a new system of smaller satellites. All of Uranus's moons orbit above Uranus's equator turned face onto the sun. Only explanation, a giant collision. But the poster boy, the single best example for this, is the double planet, the Earth and the moon. If you look at all of the other planets and their moons and add up the mass of all of the moons orbiting that planet, it is never more than one ten thousandth of the mass of the planet about which they orbit. Mars has two moons. They're both tiny lumps of rock about 10 kilometers across. Jupiter has 60 or 70 moons, but the biggest of them are only slightly bigger than our moon. Add them all together, they're only one ten thousandth the mass of Jupiter. The Earth's moon is one eighty-first the mass of the Earth. It's an absolute oddity, it's very peculiar. So trying to explain how the moon formed is something that puzzled scientists for a very long time. In the end, the only way we can explain it is that when the Earth formed, it was comparable to the planet we see today, separated out into crust, mantle and core. And then towards the end of that period, an object the size of Mars came along, smashed into the Earth. More gently than the collision that formed Mercury, so less material was flung away never to return, but once again stripping the mantle and the crust. The mantle and the crust material, a lot of it fell back to form the Earth as we see it today, but the remainder accumulated to form the Moon. Now this is really interesting because it explains one of the oddest things we know about the Moon. The Moon and the Earth must have formed together, they're moving together through space. We can find nowhere that the Earth could have captured the Moon, so if they formed together they should be made of the same things. But just like we said that Mercury is overly dense, was made of lots of metal, the Moon is under dense, it lacks for iron and nickel. Which is exactly what you would expect if the Moon were made from material from the mantle and the crust of the Earth. All the iron and nickel stuck in the core, the mantle is depleted, has too little iron and nickel. If you strip that off and form the Moon, in this giant collision, you get something next to the Earth, similar chemical setup, same amount of oxygen, same amount of carbon, same amount of phosphorus, but depleted in the heavy elements, the ions, the nickels, because they were locked up in the core of the Earth. You form a very big moon very near the Earth, and then the tidal interaction, the thing that causes the tides to rise and fall every day between the Earth and the moon, gradually causes the moon to drift away from the Earth over the four billion years since this huge collision happened, leaving us with the satellite, the double planet that we see today. And you can see just as this movie comes to an end, only 14 hours after the collision, we already have the proto-moon taking shape from the debris shattered off the Earth, and the Earth already looking a fairly cohesive blob once again. Now, there are more recent models of this. People are still looking into the story. There are still arguments about the exact nature of the collision. But this is one of our most strongly held theories, one of our most strongly supported theories in a general sense, that the Earth's moon can only have been formed by a giant collision. So that's the story of the final stages of planet formation, the time when things were truly violent, the times when planets were getting shattered, knocked over, stripped of their volatile material. We've left the rubble that is the planet Mercury, the leftover core of a once bigger planet. We've left the planet-sized crater, which explains why Mars has highlands and lowlands. We've got the removal of Venus' spin, we've got the tilt of Uranus, and we've got the formation of the Earth's moon without which some people argue we wouldn't be here today to have this conversation. A lot of people argue that without the Moon, life on Earth would not have been possible. So these giant collisions played a very important part in shaping the solar system that we observe today. But that process of collisional depletion, that process of the removal of the debris from our solar system, 
didn't stop with the end of the era of the giant collisions, but it's continued to the very day, to the very current moment. And what I'll tell you about in the next and final section is the history of the smaller collisions that have happened over the last few hundred millions of years as this tail end of planet formation comes to its close.